Hey guys, welcome to lesson 16, the African savanna ecosystem. So this is still part of theme five, where the climate and ecosystems of GCSE geography. We are nearing the end of theme five. I've grouped the kind of three parts of this ecosystem study into one recording. So feel free to stop and start it as you wish and spread it out as you wish. Um, we're going to look at the location and the climate. We're then going to look at how the vegetation is um, adapted to cope with the climate that it grows in. And then we're going to look at how humans are affecting the ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> how humans are affecting the ecosystem and how we can sustainably manage the damage that, that they're causing. So if you pause the video here a moment, go ahead and write the title down as usual then, please. Okay, so to get started, we're going to go straight in with the location. So to give you your bearings, we've got a map of the of the whole world. And coloured in green on this map are the savannah ecosystem locations. Now, this blank area here is the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest that we were just looking at. We've got the Congo rainforest in here. You've got the southeastern Malaysian and Indonesian rainforests here. So your rainforests run directly along the equator, pretty much. Savannas lie either side of rainforest ecosystems. They're sort of an in-between. They're not as wet as rainforests, but they're not as dry as the deserts um, above and below them. And you can see that here with the African savanna that we're going to use as an example. So we're focusing on the largest savanna ecosystem, which is here and here. So here's your African continent. You can see the Congo rainforest here on the equator. And then to the north and south run these two bands. They are joined of African savanna grassland, the northern African savanna and the southern African savanna. So savannas lie between hot and dry to the north and hot and wet to the south. The northern savanna does and vice versa in the southern savanna. So there's sort of an in-between. They get very wet seasons that last for a short period, and then the rest of the year is very, very arid, very, very dry. They have an extended dry period, dry season. So what I'd like you to do is, step one, draw a sketch map to show the location of the African savanna grassland. So put this subheading, put the outline of the African continent, colour on just this light green area, okay, like it looks here, look. And then add the Tropic of Cancer in the north, the equator, the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. Then we're going to write a couple of sentences to describe its location. So it's not along the equator like rainforests are. It sort of lies between the equator and the Tropic of Cancer in the north and between the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. So the African savanna is located in two bands between the equator and the Tropic of Cancer in the north and the equator and Tropic of Capricorn in the south. They lie between the rainforest and desert ecosystems to the far north and south. OK, so subheading, sketch map, description. Pause the video here a moment and put that into your books, please. OK, the next thing we're going to discuss is the African savanna climate. So I've mentioned already that it's not hot and wet all year round like the rainforest is. It has very distinct wet season and dry season. So when we look at that on a climate graph, this is what it's represented as using the data. So you can see here, bars, remember, are always precipitation. So January, February, March, April, May, and then sort of November, December, you get very little precipitation falling at all, 50 millimetres or less, virtually nothing here for one, two, three for five months of the year, nearly half the year, virtually no precipitation at all. You then get a very rapidly increasing level of precipitation towards the height of summer, and it then reduces again. So you've got this wet season here that really is from June to October, and the rest of the year is pretty dry or arid. We would, we would use the word arid. The line is the temperature. So as you can see, it's not like the rainforest temperature line, which is pretty consistent around about your sort of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. This has quite stark cooler seasons here in the winter months, and it gets much warmer around the middle of the year. 
So what I'd like you to do is we've always got to stay really highly skilled and up to date with our practice on analysing graphs. You will always get a graph question in the exam, probably more than one. Describe means say what you see. And whenever you're describing a graph, you've got to quote figures. All right. So to describe the precipitation, talk about how the trend changes. Does it increase or decrease? When is it at its highest? When is it at its lowest? And then do the same for the temperature. You can use these writing frames if you wish. I think there's a copy of this graph on the handout that accompanies this lesson. If you'd like to print it out and stick it in, then by all means do so. So put the subheading. Copy and complete these two descriptions by simply looking at the graph to ascertain when the maximum and minimum values are and what the maximum and minimum values are. And then I'd also like you to calculate the total annual rainfall, the average annual rainfall and the temperature range. Total meaning altogether, annual meaning for the year. So it is a bit of a fiddly job. Take a ruler so you don't go wonky and read off, make sure you're reading off the precipitation axes. For every single bar, obtain a value of precipitation for that month, add them all up. That's your total annual rainfall. To get the average annual rainfall, whatever answer you had for this, average means you divide it by the number of values you had. So whatever the total was, you divide it by 12, because we've got 12 months. Range means the difference between the highest and lowest. So again, get your ruler to make sure you don't go wonky. Highest temperature, lowest temperature, subtract the minimum from the maximum, and that will give you the temperature range. So pause the video here. Subheading, describe the trend of precipitation, describe the trend of temperature, calculate the total annual, the average annual rainfall, and the temperature range. Go ahead and do that now, please. OK, so obviously, because we've got that extended dry season, still with pretty high temperatures, it never really drops below 16 degrees Celsius. So, oh, excuse me, it's quite late on a Sunday. <laughs> so we've got this very arid season in the year where very little to no precipitation falls at all. So how on earth does vegetation cope with these extremes of high temperatures and dry periods throughout the year? So we're going to look at two types of trees in particular. And the first one we're going to look at is a baobab tree. So put a subheading, African savanna vegetation adaptation. Stick a baobab tree picture down with room to write around it. We're going to talk about four or five different adaptations for this special tree. OK, so for trees to survive dry climate, you have to reduce the amount of water that you lose and increase the amount of water that you can take in and store. And the ways that the baobab tree does this, first off, its bark is fire resistant. Wildfires are really commonplace in the African savanna, especially in the dry season, maybe a lightning, a lightning strike or something like that, or maybe a fire from one of the local tribes will spark a wildfire and it will just spread through the savanna and destroy everything in its path. So over thousands of years, the baobab tree has adapted to have fire resistant bark and the tribes actually use sections of this bark to build their homes, to protect their own homes from wildfires. Secondly, this tree is known as the tree of life to the, to the indigenous people that live close to it. It can store up to 500 litres of water in its trunk. So tribes often tap into that and extract water in the dry season so that they have water to drink all year round. They don't obviously extract so much that it affects the tree, but they can store up to 500 litres of water in its butt, in its trunk. And you can see that from the, it's quite a stumpy wide tree. Um, in fact, I think the next, yeah, they can grow um, about 30 metres tall, which isn't super, super tall, but their trunk is seven metres in diameter if you walked all the way around its base, so it's quite wide. They can live for over a thousand years. The way that they absorb as much precipitation as, as quickly as possible is their root system is very, very shallow. 
So as soon as the precipitation falls onto the soil and infiltrates even just a tiny bit, it's going to hit that root system and the plant can draw that water up and store it in the trunk, just like we were talking about. So it's got very specially adapted methods of taking in water and it reduces the amount that it loses through transpiration by having very few leaves. And the leaves that it does have are very, very small. So transpiration loss is greatly reduced. So it sucks it in quick, stores it for ages and loses very little of the water that it has. Pause the video here a moment and make sure you've got all those annotations down before we move on to the next tree. Okay, the next tree that we're going to look at is an acacia tree. So as you can see, as you can see this looks very, very different. It doesn't have a wide stumpy trunk. It's got sort of a much broader, thinner canopy of leaves there. So again, stick it down and title it with room to write around it. So the adaptations that this tree has developed include, as I just mentioned, its canopy is very, very thin and very, very wide. So it actually, the way that it behaves, it reduces evaporation loss through transpiration. Also, this tree is quite smart. Having a wide canopy like that shades its roots from the baking hot sun. So the water that's in the soil doesn't evaporate as quickly. It also provides shades for animals. And when animals come into the area, they might eat the seeds that the tree has dropped, or they might defecate, they might poop in the area underneath the tree. So number one, you've got a seed dispersal system. When the animals eat your seeds, they wander off somewhere else, poop out the seed, and then more acacia trees will grow across the savanna. Number two, the poop that they do underneath the shade of this tree can be fertilizer for itself. It puts nutrients into the soil as part of the nutrient cycle. So it's pretty smart. It's also very, very thorny because you don't want to attract all these animals and then get eaten. So it's got very thorny branches and all around and in amongst the leaves. The animals have adapted to this over the years, though. Giraffes in particular are very, very skilled at stripping leaves, even from very thorny branches. It only grows about 20 metres in height. This is a common feature of vegetation in the savannah. Because it gets so hot um, and wind speeds can get quite high, you don't want to grow too tall because you're going to get really dried out and far too hot. So 20 metres, 30 metres maximum, you're looking at vegetation growing to in the savannah. And you just sort of have isolated patches of trees. The rest is just grassland, hence the name. The leaves have a waxy covering on them. And this means that the evaporation loss is greatly reduced so it can store the water for longer. It has the opposite approach to the baobab tree when it comes to absorbing water. In the dry season the top layers of soil dry out very very quickly and you have to go really deep underground to find the groundwater stores beneath the water table. The water table is the layer underneath the soil below which the rocks and soil are still storing water. Now, legend has it that elephants are very good at sniffing out um, where the water table is close to the surface during the dry season. They're very good at finding sources of water. But what the acacia tree does is it has a very deep root system so that in the dry season, when the water table drops and the groundwater is deeper and deeper underground, it can still reach it. So take a moment and pause the video. Make sure your image is stuck down and titled and write these adaptations around it, please. Okay, next step. As usual, when humans come along, they tend to unbalance and upset what's going on in nature. So what we're going to look at now is what are the threats to the African savanna grassland. Just like the rainforest, the African savanna is under threat from biodiversity loss, from deforestation due to humans. And these are the leading causes. Okay, so I think you've got these little images in your handout. So if you'd like to cut and stick them alongside what we're going to write, just breaks it up a bit more nicely for when you come to revise. But if you pause here for a moment and just set yourself up with the first one, what are the threats to the African savanna grassland as a subheading? And then what I'll do is kind of walk you through them and then you can you can write them um, in, at your own pace by pausing and re-listening to what I've said. In fact, I think actually the next slide might have the main notes on that you can use to copy down. So set up your subheading and set up that first picture. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so poaching is the illegal hunting and killing of animals. The countries in the African savanna grassland are all LICs. That means that there are very few job opportunities, and the job opportunities that there are, the majority of the population can't access them because the systems weren't there to train people in the first place. They haven't gone to school. They probably live far from anywhere where there is an, an educational opportunity. And even if there was, they probably couldn't afford it. So you've got illiterate, uneducated <clears throat> uh, people living in the African savanna grassland that are just trying to find a way to support their family. So poaching is a difficult thing to stop because it's a get rich quick solution. You can earn an awful lot of money from just a few elephant tusks or rhino horns. The sad thing is, it's not just animals that have monetary value that are being poached, that are being hunted illegally. It's also people are hungry. So you often get the illegal hunting and killing of prey speech species, such as antelopes and things like that, for people to actually eat and to feed their families. But the issue there is it then unbalances the food chain. If you're hunting the prey of other wild animals, what are the lions then going to eat? What are the hyenas going to eat? Um, so, yeah, that's the issue with poaching. Poor farming methods. Like I said, farming is one of the leading employment sectors in LICs because it tends to be just traditional methods passed down through family members, through generations. You don't have to have been to school. You don't need high levels of education. It provides a way for people to earn a living of some sort. However, due to lack of education and understanding, the farming methods they're using are very poor and they're actually causing lasting damage and a bit of a downward spiral. What happens is they tend to repeatedly farm the same area year after year after year. They don't rotate the area that they're farming and that means that the soil doesn't have a chance to recover. It's called, leave, it's called leaving a fallow period when you just leave a field alone or leave an area alone so that the nutrients can recover naturally in the soil and you can then farm it again. Farmers in LICs don't have the luxury of having acres and acres and acres and acres of land where they could do that rotation. So they tend to farm the same area repeatedly until it becomes exhausted of nutrients and exhausted of moisture and then nothing can regrow, whether that's crops for the farmers or any grassland or savanna trees for the ecosystem. So they just move on to the next area and do exactly the same thing and destroy that patch, move on to the next area, do exactly the same thing, and destroy that patch. And what starts to happen is desertification sets in. Once that soil has no nutrients, no moisture and nothing can regrow, there's no roots holding the soil together, there's nothing left, the wind will blow it away. When the wet season arrives, the rain will wash it away, high levels of soil erosion, the land will start to turn to desert and that is irreversible. Land clearance for towns, roads, fuel, wood, agriculture. We've mentioned a few times now that population growth is one of the leading issues sort of facing our planet at the moment. And nowhere is it higher than in LICs. So what little vegetation there is in the savanna is being removed to expand human areas, urbanisation. When you remove the vegetation, it breaks the water cycle and it breaks the nutrient cycle. So there's no transpiration going into the air to make more rain, which is essential in this arid climate. There's no nutrients left in the soil because there's no trees there to drop any leaves to put nutrients back into the litter store. You're breaking the nutrient and water cycles and the area is just not going to recover. And again, you'll get desertification setting in. Finally, overgrazing. This is very similar to the poor farming methods issue. Livestock aren't fenced in the African savanna. They can wander wherever they like, and goats in particular, if you Google goats in trees, I kid you not, no goat yeah, pun intended. Oh, all right, phone. Sorry, my phone. <laughs> my phone's just Googled um, goats in trees and given me some images that match. So, but yeah, if you look it up, goats will eat anything and they're very, very agile. They're very, very good climbers. And you'll see images of goats, of trees that are full of goats. But what that means is because goats aren't fenced, they can wander wherever they like, they can get to the very top of trees, they will eat every last leaf and every last bit of grass off of everything they come across. And that not only kills the vegetation, but again, you're breaking the water cycle. Once there's no vegetation, because they've eaten it all, there's no transpiration, less moisture in the air, fewer clouds, no precipitation, and the climate becomes even drier. Desertification kicks in. Also, the soil is already pretty dry and their hooves will trample it. And then as soon as the wind blows, 
because their hooves have broken and trampled up that dry soil, wind erosion will happen and the soil gets eroded, further leading to desertification and the land will just turn to desert. You can't bring it back. So in summary, I waffled around quite a little bit there. Now there is a typo here. Yeah, that's one of my trademark. That should say tusks. <laughs> OK, so if you want to go back and re-listen to what I said, I've actually said more than is on here if you want to add anything further. But here are some notes that you could use to formulate your own words as to the impact that humans are having on the African savanna grasslands. So pause the video here a moment. Cut and stick your pictures, put in your own notes and information about the impact we're having on this ecosystem. All right, so moving on to the last part of this um, ecosystem study. As usual, humans are causing damage. How can we reduce the damage and manage it sustainably? So just like we looked at sustainable management strategies for the rainforest ecosystem, there are sustainable way forwards for the African savanna as well. The problem we're up against, it's the same in any LIC where biodiversity and ecosystems are being destroyed. People at a local level just trying to support their families and the government at a national level just trying to become a HIC, it's all driven by money. So we need to find a way for people to still support their families, for the economy to still make money so it can reinvest it in healthcare, education and infrastructure, but in a way that isn't going to permanently damage the ecosystem or the culture of the people that already live in that area. And this is why it's so difficult to stop. It all comes down to money. It all comes down to people having no other choice. There is no other choice than to chop down what wood is in the area for firewood and for building your homes because you don't have any other option. You don't have concrete blocks. You don't have bricks. What are you going to build your home out of? How are you going to support your family to earn just a little bit of money so that you can send your children to school and try and work their way out of poverty? The ivory trade is one of the easiest ways to do that. We're losing on average across the African savanna. We're talking about seven to 10 rhinos a day. We're talking about more elephants than that per day. We're talking tons of ivory still being traded per year, but we can't be mad at the people that are doing it. They're sort of backed into a corner. This is what happens. This is what poverty makes people do. So we need to allow them to make money whilst protecting the ecosystem. Let's take a look at some ideas. Oh, before we do that, you need to understand the impact of it on the on the savanna ecosystem. So, for example, when it comes to urbanization and population growth, you need more space for building and you need more space for farming because we've got more people that we need to feed. Straight away, obviously, you're going to get habitat loss. And that's going to mean that the food web and food chains collapse and you're going to get species numbers going into decline because there's nothing to eat and there's nowhere to live. and You're going to end up with extinctions. At the moment, we're looking at around 1 million species going extinct around about now. There's only 8 million species on the entire planet. So we're heading down a slippery slope. If you've removed the vegetation, what they normally then do to clear the land to grow crops or build homes or, or whatever is burn it. It's called slash and burn. Now, trees are a carbon sink, remember, so all the CO2 that they've absorbed, when you then burn those trees, it's rapidly released back into the atmosphere. Plus, you've cut down the vegetation, so the CO2 that you're rapidly releasing isn't going to get reabsorbed because there's no trees to suck it back in. And those two things combined are going to contribute to increased climate change. Now, if the temperatures start rising, add to that that because we've cut the trees down, we've broken the water cycle, there's no transpiration now, increased climate change and loss of vegetation breaking the water cycle means that rainfall becomes even less reliable in an ecosystem that already has six months of the year with little to no rain at all. And following on from that, the soil will become even drier and even more um, not deprived of nutrients, what's the word? Oh, I can't think of the word. Um, anyway, but no nutrients and no moisture left in the soil. 
add to that that again because we've removed the vegetation there's no leaves falling we've broken the nutrient cycle plus poor farming methods sucking out any moisture and nutrients that are left all of that is going to mean well that bit of land is ruined let's cut down some more and we're in this downward spiral that will cause the area to become permanently ah, devoid devoid is that the word devoid of nutrients that's what i was trying to think of this cycle will continue until a wider and wider area is left of soil that has no nutrients and no moisture left in it and it will become so dried out and devoid of nutrients that as soon as the wet season arrives or as soon as the wind blows that precipitation will wash away or the wind will blow away what little soil was left and it will turn to desert that's the desertification process it's a downward spiral it's what we call a tipping point if this carries on we won't be able to bring it back so put this subheading and put down this kind of feedback loop with its outside contributing factors um, into your book Okay, so the last thing is clearly we need to do something about this because otherwise basically what's going to happen to the northern African savannah is as that land turns to desert because of desertification, the Sahara Desert is basically expanding to the south, covering more and more of what was savannah grassland. Where are those tribes going to go? Where are the animals going to go? Where are the farmers going to go? What's going to happen to food production levels? People are going to start to starve. You're going to get extended famine. Mali, which is in this region of African savannah, um, to the northern edge, right on the edge of the Sahara, has already had little to no rain whatsoever for three years. So drought conditions are, are worsening because of this downward spiral. So sustainable management strategies we're going to look at three or four different ideas now you do have the images for these in your handouts if you'd like to cut and stick them to just break up your writing then by all means do so what we're going to do for each one is discuss how it works and what the advantages and disadvantages are so we are evaluating what are the upsides and downsides so one idea that's been proposed is called the great green wall and it's literally what it says on the tin. We plant a massive wall, a huge band of trees that runs across the entire width of the African continent. From the Atlantic Ocean in the west, all the way through to what goes out into become the Indian Ocean over here in the east. Okay. Now it crosses several different countries. I think it might be 13 different LICs. Now then the idea is more trees means more transpiration. That's going to put moisture back in the air, it's going to kickstart the water cycle again, you're going to get more rain falling, and it's going to rehydrate that area that's drying out so badly so you can farm it better and you've got a more reliable supply of water. In addition, the roots will hold the soil together, and the leaves that will fall off the trees will kickstart the nutrient cycle again. So there'll be less soil erosion because the roots are holding it together. There'll be more nutrients because you've now got the nutrient cycle kicked back in. And there'll be more moisture because the water cycle is kicked back in as well. Plus, of course, you're creating habitats. So loads of environmental benefits. However, you're asking 13 different low-income countries to cooperate. The governments of which are... It's, it's unlikely that that's going to happen for something to work in poor countries. Usually it's got to be quite small scale, simple, easy technology. This is very cheap and simple. You just plant baby trees. But it's too large scale. It probably will fall apart because you can't monitor it. People are going to cut it down for fuel wood and getting governments to cooperate and all pay their fair share and all contribute their fair amount of effort. It probably will fall apart at the seams. So subheading Great Green Wall little sentence about what it is. It's a border of trees that runs right across sub-Saharan Africa. And here's your upsides and downsides. Summarize them if you wish, but get them down in your book. I think it's always a good idea to use different colors when we're talking about pros and cons, because it just helps you to visualize and cement into your long-term memory the good points and bad points if they're in different colors and they're distinct from each other. So pause the video here a minute. Subheading Great Green Wall. How does it work? Upsides, downsides.
Okay, the next idea is drought resistant crops. So again, these are exactly what they say on the tin. They can resist drought. They can lay dormant, which means still alive but not growing, in the soil with little to no rain for up to three years, which is perfect for these drought stricken countries. That would mean higher crop yields when the rains do arrive. A yield is how much something gives you. And if you've got higher crop yields, you've got more to eat, so there'll be less famine. But it also means you'll have some left over to sell, which means more disposable income and a higher standard of living for farmers. Crops such as millet and maize, it's not just a cash crop, it can be eaten. So it's going to improve people's quality of life. They're going to be happier and they're going to be healthier because they've got a better diet. And it explains there that they can lie dormant in the soil for up to three years. So it's perfect for this drought stricken region of the world. However, they are GM crops, genetically modified, genetically engineered crops that are designed to last without rainfall. To come up with that crop would have taken years of research. Therefore, they're more expensive to buy. So it might not be an option for low income country farmers. And if the rains don't arrive within three years, even these crops will die. And with climate change being a major issue, that negative feedback loop that you just saw in the previous um, section being an issue, it's becoming more and more likely that some even these crops won't withstand the length of dry season that some of these areas are going to be experiencing in the near future. So put a subheading and stick your image. And then again, upsides and downsides of drought resistant crops. Okay, next idea is stone walls. The other word for this is a bund line. These are simple, free, easy to make technolo technology. You basically gather a load of stones and build a, like, a low wall across the direction the land is sloping. So the idea is that when it rains, the soil that would have been washed away and the moisture that would have been lost to surface runoff as it's flowing down the slope, this bund line traps it. So any soil that's been eroded gets trapped and you can redistribute it across your farmland. Any runoff that would have been lost, surface runoff, gets trapped. So it has time to infiltrate, put moisture back into the soil. So you're not losing the soil. You can still farm the area. And you're not losing the moisture. You can still farm the area. Simple, small scale, natural materials. It's ideal. However, Really, it's very labour intensive. You've got to build these things by hand um, and it can only be used on a very small scale across an area of a couple of acres or so because you simply won't find en enough rocks. So whilst I'm saying small scale is better in poor countries, you know, you need the materials to make it large scale enough to actually work across the farmland that, that you won't if you're an LIC farmer. So cut and stick the image, subheading, upsides and downsides. OK, the final strategy is national parks. National parks all over the world serve exactly the same purpose, whether you're talking about the Brecon Beacons or you're talking about Snowdonia or you're talking about the Serengeti. They are protected areas of land where no unmonitored and unchecked human activity is allowed to happen, whether that's building new homes in Snowdonia National Park without using traditional stone and local materials or whether that's poaching of animals in the Serengeti. So the area is completely protected, save for perhaps some ecotourism. So animal populations are going to thrive. Species extinction levels will drop. Habitats are protected. The ecosystem is protected. Ecotourism tour guides. You're employing local people. So the money they earn is going directly to their communities, directly to the people that need it most. It's not going to the corrupt governments. So it's very, very effective. It also doesn't disturb tribal cultures of, of indigenous people. So socially, environmentally, and on a small scale, economically, this is very, very sustainable. The money from ecotourism as well could go into the economy of the whole country. It can be used to be reinvested in healthcare, education and infrastructure to help move the country towards becoming an, an HIC instead of an LIC. However, 
there are more people. Cities are expanding. If you make all the land in the area protected, where are we going to build new homes for people? Where are we going to expand our cities and put our infrastructure to cope with increasing population? Really, we need to reduce population growth so that we don't need to face that that conundrum. But like it or not, population growth is still increasing. People have got to go somewhere. So if you protect all of the land, it's probably going to cause conflict over what little land is left that you're allowed to build on. So, subheading, upsides, downsides, images. Off you go. Okay, so that is lesson 16 done. Where is the African savanna? What is the climate like? What are the plants like? How are people using and exploiting the ecosystem? What effect does that exploitation have? And how can we sustainably manage it? All tied up nicely in one rather lengthy, to be fair, video tutorial. So if you have any questions, email me as usual, gleasona at hubcumry.net. Otherwise, I'll see you for lesson 17. We've only got a couple left to go in this theme.